The British beat boom had been a predominantly northern or working class phenomenon. But the architects of progressive rock were escapees from entirely different backgrounds. I suppose for a rock and roller, my education was completely wrong. My mum and dad, I mean, literally did go without food to, to send me to piano lessons. I never found that out till many, many years on. And I went there when I was five. Uh, and I loved it. My family had a varied taste in music, and they were very opinionated about it. Of course, I liked Cliff Richard and the Shadows, and they were going, nonsense, you, you won't even know who these people are next year. And... I was in this attic and I put on this Vivaldi record or something, it was Four Seasons or something, and I just flipped. I mean, I just went, this is fantastic stuff. Studied Stravinsky's Dumbarton Oaks concerto, did a lot of church music, sang in choirs. At the same time as being obsessively interested in you know, the shadows. Went to the Guildhall went to the Royal Academy, had lots of private tuition, lots of private tuition, but uh, never really wanted to be in an orchestra, or a jazz group for that matter. I wanted to be a rock drummer. I got a scholarship to the Royal College of Music, and I went there, and I left after a year and a half. I thought, this is nuts, this whole thing. I mean, the college were really, really anti any form of music if it wasn't serious classical music. They would either have become classical musicians, I suppose, because they had, a lot of them had classical training to grade, whatever it is, or they would have become jazzers. But the jazz scene in, in, in Britain was never that exciting. It was always such hard work. In 66, 67, jazz was in a bad place. Jazz was free jazz. It was squeaky bump jazz, you know, kind of squeaking away. And any red-blooded drummer age 17 at that time would have wanted to play with Jimi Hendrix rather than the spontaneous music ensemble. But what made pop so attractive to some inexperienced young musicians was, well, the girls. There's this whole other half of the human race, and like it says in Some Like It Hot, I tell you, it's a whole different sex. There was girls. Where were they? They were in calves. What were they doing? Sitting there. What did they They, they had... Uh, Chalk white pink lipstick on. And I thought, I don't quite know what, what they're for or what you meant to do in them, but I would thought, you know, there's something great about this lot. You couldn't talk to them, but what you could do is put on uh, a, a little Richard record on the jukebox, and then it would unify the room. Uh, you couldn't put on Bartok violin concerto. That wouldn't have impressed anybody, it wouldn't have unified the room, wouldn't have got everybody tapping their feet. But the classical tradition had gripped a generation of rock and rollers determined to show that pop music could also be profound and grown up. In the winter of love, Prokel Hiram scored another first when they recorded an 18-minute suite in Held Twas In Eye for their album Shine On Brightly. The search for meaning and significance was on. I said, I think we should do like, a great work. That's what I called it. In fact, it was called O Magnum Harum for a while. <laughs> Start off at beginning of the universe, what we did, and ended in heaven. And all the trials and tribulations that come in between, with a bit of sitar chucked in. You know, somebody had to do it, I suppose. You know, if it hadn't have been Procol Harm at that point, it would have been somebody, you know, four weeks later. Now, we can actually write music. And if we're going to write music, the model is classical music. And classical music has extended forms, sonatas, uh, symphonies. So we're going to do structures and pieces that last a long time that try and give us that credibility musically.
The Nice, originally P.P. Arnold's backing band, set the controls for the heart of classical music, jazz, and the modern stage musical on their maiden voyage into progressive rock. Frontman Keith Emerson was the Hendrix of the Hammond organ, making his instrument scream and sigh in dazzling displays of technical virtuosity and crazed physicality. Their first unlikely hit was a seven-minute version of Leonard Bernstein's America from West Side Story, transformed into an instrumental prog rock protest song. Progressive music didn't only come from the big cities. Welcome to Canterbury, the posh cathedral town that seeded those musicians who would in time grow into Soft Machine, Caravan, Hatfield in the North and Matching Mole, all stemming from a little known local group called the Wild Flowers. The Wild Flowers didn't do loads of gigs, probably only about one a fortnight, maybe, maybe one a week, because we weren't very popular. <laughs> <laughs> Those lads were very much into um, Thelonious Monk, John Coltrane, Dizzy Gillespie. We tried to do sort of danceable versions of that kind of music, you see, just to be different and awkward. I like me, I like you, and the things that we do. Don't mind love you too. I don't like it if people think, you know, that we thought that the, the, the clever grammar school people came in and thought we were doing something better than just mere pop. We were awestruck by pop music, by the magnificence of Beatles, of Motown, and really we just wanted to participate in it, but getting our little groups together, our own dialects of other stuff we picked up crept into what we did. You know, I'm playing beat drums, and I'm trying to sound like a you know, rhythm and blues drummer, but I have been listening to all these sophisticated jazz drummers, you know, and I was sort of cluttered with with stuff. You know, you can't sit and pretend you haven't heard Elvin Jones if you have, you know. Soft Machine was the first band to emerge from the Wild Flowers. They headed for London's newly established underground clubs, playing with groups such as Arthur Brown and Pink Floyd at Middle Earth and UFO. In that club you got everything from vaudeville to uh, rock to jazz to electronics to pure percussion, to theatre, to poetry, to dance, to naked people wandering around. That was what we all gravitated towards, UFO and Middle Earth. That was the, the culture that defined us. Well, we sort of stoned people, listening to music played by stoned bands, uh, and uh, as long as everybody was stoned, everybody thought it was really good. We hadn't really got enough tunes um, to just do songs. So I uh, thought, oh, I remember, what do you do about that? I know. What do jazz musicians do? They improvise. So you just pick a couple of chords in there and just keep going on them. And so tunes become ten minute events. This is not because we've all become virtuoso, it's not in our case. It's because we haven't got enough tunes to stretch one and a half hours. Our organist Mike Ratledge was older than us, taller, and his father had been headmaster and who had an Oxford degree, so therefore assumed immediate uh, seniority. <laughs> well, there's the fuzz box, which sounds like this. Well, if once he puts his fuzz on, you had to keep playing, you couldn't take your hand off because it would start feeding back. So he developed a solo style of absolutely continual la, 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 notes without a single break in.
So we've got, we can do these sort of trance-like things with that, you know, where you get this sound going on ages and ages without a single pause.